All right, so we are now recording this for posterity. <laughs> um, so also this winter at UCD, we have the native plant sale going on and it runs through the end of February. Um, so if you're curious about what plants are available still, um, some species have already sold out, but you can still find some really good plants that we'll even be talking about tonight. Um, and you can place your order directly on the UCD website. Plant pickup this year will be on Saturday, March 19th in White Salmon. And we also look forward to having Tree Fest and a day of sale this year. So you can place an online order from the inventory we have remaining. Um, and the other option is to come on March 19th and see what species we have available there. They'll probably be at slightly lower numbers, but that's a, an option for you. Um, you can also view our most recent news and updates by signing up for the UCDE newsletter. That's on our web page as well. Um, and many, many other resources there. So um, check out our webpage if you haven't already. And um, we will get started with a few logistics here. Um, Jan Thomas, a resource specialist at Underwood Conservation District is our moderator tonight. Um, she's gonna go ahead and describe a few details as we get started. Yeah, thanks Tova and welcome everybody tonight. I'm just gonna kind of be in the background here helping us with this. Um, workshop webinar. So just, uh, I think we're all pretty familiar with Zoom probably by this point, um, but just a couple of reminders to please keep yourself muted um, throughout the presentation. We are going to um, have a couple of pauses throughout um, tonight, mostly after each presenter, um, just for a couple of quick questions if we have any, but we will have a dedicated um, Q&A session at the end. For questions, you can either raise your hand um, with that little raise your hand feature, which should be down in the um, bottom bar kind of near your mute and those options. Um, you can raise your hand and then I'll call on you just to kind of keep folks going in turn um, and not speaking over each other. So raise your hand and I'll call on you if you wanna um, just ask verbally or you're welcome to put stuff into the chat box as well. And um, we can read that out for you. Um, if you have any problems with your computer audio, you can always call in to the Zoom instead. Sometimes that works a little bit better. And if you're just having any issues in a general way with um, audio or visual, just uh, type them into that chat box and I can help you kind of try to troubleshoot a little bit on the side. Um, we are going to have a couple of polls, I believe, tonight. So that should just pop up on your screen for you and go away when we're done. So if you wouldn't mind um, submitting your answer when you see those polls. And I think, I think that's it. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, but otherwise, I, I think we're all, we're, we're all Zoom, Zoom experts these days. So um, I'll turn it back to you, Tova. Okay, thanks, Jan. Yeah, as we found last year, the online platform for our workshops worked pretty well. Um, and of course, we miss seeing you all in person, face to face, but the benefits of being at home maybe include sitting on your couch by the fire with your feet up, maybe even sipping eggnog. Uh, so I hope you're all getting comfortable. Um, we're also excited to see increased participation and reach through these events. And so that's been another positive outcome uh, with these uh, new and different times we're in. So without further delay, we'll get started in tonight's topic. Um, and we hope you'll all find ways to dig in and create positive change in your own backyards after learning from our speakers tonight. So I'm going to put up tonight's program. Um, I'm going to continue talking just for a little bit longer um, with the, the beginning of this presentation. And then we have some great speakers. In addition, we have Dan Richardson from Underwood Conservation District to introduce the Yard by Yard program that we've been able to um, unveil in this past year. And Todd Jacobson with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is here to talk about wildlife interactions. So that's going to be really important to hear what he has to say. Um, and Chris Shadell, who works at Hood River Soil and Water Conservation District, is also one of our um, participants in the Yard by Yard program. So she's here to um, describe her experience with that um, in the local area here. Um, so 
you'll see there's a couple more items here. Sketch your own yard. <laughs> and that's something that um, I'd like to ask you all to do again and in the comfort of your own home. Grab a piece of paper and pencil and we're going to do a little bit of brain work um, in our own homes and thinking about our, our properties, your front yard, your backyard, whatever it may be. So we'll be um, doing that in just a minute. But first, I want to launch the first poll just to get to know who you all are. So let's see if I can even do this. Darn. Jan, are you a co-host and can you find the poll? It's saying I'm inactive or logged in from another device, so I'm not able. Yeah, I think I've launched it here. So if you guys can see that, um, just a quick question about kind of where you're located. Did you launch it? Because I'm just not seeing it. Did anyone else see it? Yeah, okay. we're getting folks answering here. Good. Yeah, just give it one more second here. Okay. And I'll share the results. So Tova, I don't know if you can see that, but it looks like we've got um, just about half of the folks are Click Attack County and about another third, uh, Skamania County, Hood River, a couple of folks, and then um, one other. So a surprise guest with us tonight. Great. Yeah, thanks. Good. Well, it's always good to know who we're speaking with. And um, of course, since most of you are in the district area, I want to talk a little bit about who we are and where we are. Um, we're Underwood Conservation District, and we cover all of Skamania County and the western portion of Klickitat County, um, including those communities that you see on your screen. Um, it's a total of 2,181 square miles, which is huge, um, but a lot of it is in public hands with the National Forest, National Monument, and even some state land. So we really do focus with the private landowners in our work. Um, and so that, that reduces the area just a bit. Um, but yeah, we work with the public and landowners and stakeholders to provide lots of natural resource information and project support. Um, like many local special service districts, we are locally led. We have our own board of directors um, and supervisors that help oversee our work. Um, and then we have a small staff of five that work in our office and as well as remotely these days. Uh, we're non-regulatory, we're neutral, and our mission is to engage landowners and land users throughout Skamania and West Klickitat counties in the voluntary conservation enhancement, stewardship, and sustainable use of natural resources. And here's a long list of the variety of work that we do at the Conservation District. You can see it covers a wide range, um, almost all types of natural resource issues. And if we don't have a program or the expertise that you're looking for, we can help point you in the right direction to get your questions answered. So keep us in mind for things um, beyond just backyard conservation um, and refer us to your neighbors and friends. Thanks. Um, so with that, we'll get started with today's topic specifically. And like I said, if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, don't worry about how ugly or pretty your drawing is, but just start sketching. And um, what we're looking for right this moment is just a sketch of your current yard, whether that's your backyard, your front yard, the whole thing. Um, if you've got five or 10 or more acres, maybe just focus on the, the area right around the home where you spend the most time and try to just sketch out the existing conditions today. So we're not dreaming quite yet, but we're just pointing out the basics, major structures, the north arrow, that'll help show where it's sunny, where it's shady, where your water may be. Um, this drawing has downspouts marked for where water comes off the roof. Um, any impervious surfaces, are good to mark out and there, any slope if you have that on your property. Um, and then you probably have some existing vegetation that's desirable. So if you have large trees or other desirable vegetation that you plan to keep, um, that's good to, to show as well. 
So go ahead and just sketch this out best you can just to get us started. And then I'm really hoping that throughout these presentations tonight that you'll gain a lot of new ideas and um, just add them to your sketch. Start um, playing with it and seeing what works where. So um, by the end of tonight, we may have a few people in this audience willing to share their sketch. So that's an option to you if you'd like to consider it for the end of the evening. All right, so to get us started, what is backyard conservation? Uh, it involves managing your landscape and there's many parts to that. There's the soil, the water, plants and habitat. So even on a small scale, your little slice of heaven, if, if it's a quarter acre, um, that's still a landscape that has soil, water, plants and habitat. Um, we're going to talk about planting native vegetation. We're going to focus a lot on different native plants. Uh, we'll talk about water and conserving water as well as protecting water quality and preventing water pollution. We'll talk about soil and soil health and we'll also be talking about wildlife habitat and pollinator habitat and how to enhance that. Um, often these practices are practical and sustainable and they require less inputs, less maintenance than some of our more standard conventional landscapes. And why are we talking about this? Um, first, I want to thank Dan Richardson at Underwood CD for some of the following slides. Um, but we have experienced loss of habitat in North America. Um, for the last few centuries, we've um, experienced that. And less than 5% of our space is undisturbed at this point. We've also chopped it into habitat islands um, due to roads, freeways, railroads, um, cities, and so many other developments that really divide the habitat and fragment it and make it smaller and smaller um, for the species that have existed here. Uh, several birds and insects are experiencing ongoing declines. Um, neotropical birds are one example like swallows, tanagers, flycatchers, orioles, um, and we, we see a loss of 1% per year happening over the last 50 years. So with that kind of rate of loss, we will face numerous extinctions and reduced habitats into the future. Um, reduced habitats uh, inevitably leads to reduced number of species, fewer species and fewer um, numbers and, and diversity of species. So um, with that kind of outlook, there's many reasons to, to be looking at the alternatives. Um, we all recognize this type of landscape. It's one of the most common ways to landscape around homes in the US. Um, and while green lawns have a purpose in place, it's not the only way to go. There are many, many alternative ways to develop a beautiful landscape, which also create habitat, conserve and protect water, reduce chemical inputs and reduce maintenance and work even. So creating habitat space isn't about taking away, it's about adding and adding local biodiversity, adding food and shelter for wildlife and pollinators and adding ecological resiliency. And we wanna recommend this book, Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Tallamy, who said, it is now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing to make a difference. In this case, the difference will be to the future of biodiversity, to the native plants and animals of North America and the systems that sustain them. So I'm gonna talk a bit about native plants um, and why do we promote native plants so strongly? Um, first, they're adapted to our climate, our local conditions, including our soil, our precipitation. Um, and because they're adapted to the local conditions, they conserve water. They don't need additional irrigation once they're established. They're hardy and they can usually handle the seasonal stress of our local climate. Um, and they can also handle native pests and diseases because that's what they've co-adapted with. Um, and Due to all that, they need very little maintenance and that reduces pollution because we're not having to use fertilizers and pesticides and any other inputs. So um, needless to say, they provide food and habitat for
for other native species, including birds, beneficial insects, and other wildlife. Um, and again, those, those critters have co-adapted with native vegetation, so they rely on each other. More benefits include the, the human use of some of these native plants, including their berries, their canes, their flowers, the honey. Um, they provide living fences and screens and hedgerows. They protect water quality and they protect soil health. Uh, we often use them to protect stream banks. Um, Naturally, obviously they grow along streams and they help reduce erosion and protect those stream banks from, um, from further erosion. Many fire resistant plants um, are, are considered firewise because they've, they've co-adapted again, co-evolved with um, natural wildfire cycles. <clears throat> and then of course, having a robust uh, native plant ecosystem prevents noxious weed encroachment. <clears throat> as soon as you open up a space and clear it that you'll probably see weeds moving in. And then not to mention they're beautiful and you'll get to see some of those photos coming throughout our presentations tonight. Um, of course, there's a lot of variety in plant types. Um, there's the low growing bunch grasses, sedges, flowers and forbs. There's the shrubs in the middle layer and then there's tall, small and tall trees. So um, having that variety in structure is really important to have um, multiple canopy layers. And then we also encourage um, irregular edges and kind of just having more linear surface area to allow for more hiding spots, more diverse structure again for um, bugs and, and uh, wildlife that wanna um, inhabit these areas. Here's an example of a pollinator hedgerow drawing um, from Benton Soil and Water Conservation District in Corvallis. And as you can see with 17 different native plant species, there's a huge variety in size, height, and colors and foliage. Um, they bloom at different times, which is really important for pollinator habitat. Um, and these types of plantings can be beautiful, serve many functions and still be beautiful. So beyond native vegetation, um, there are definitely some other goals of backyard conservation. Uh, thanks to Hood River Soil and Water Conservation District, where I borrowed some of these photos and uh, graphics, I'll help try to illustrate these concepts. So um, we can reduce the nuisance of unwanted water and mud in the areas in areas of the landscape. We can reduce soil erosion and keep soil healthy. Uh, we can prevent just sending a water problem downstream or downhill. And we can utilize that water where it's needed most. So think about on your property and in, in your sketch, where does rain fall on your property? Do you have permeable surfaces or do you have impermeable or impervious surfaces? So I'm sure you know the difference on these, but, but of course our homes and our driveways and our streets and sidewalks, those are impervious surfaces and the water again gets sent downhill and down, down to the next neighbor or if you've ever been in a big brainstorm in white salmon, water is gushing down the, the curbs and gutters. Um, and then inevitably that water ends up in our local streams and rivers. So that's something that a lot of people don't quite connect always, but the water that lands on your roof and on your property, um, if you don't have a place to catch that water, it's going to run off into local streams, wetlands, and lakes. And in urban settings, um, it's something to be aware of that stormwater systems that catch stormwater, off, they rarely treat that stormwater. So in this area, that stormwater is running straight into your nearest river. Um, and that eventually ends up in the Columbia River. <clears throat> so of course, there's a lot of pollutants on our road, lots of oils, um, anything that you've been spraying on your garden and on your lawn is likely to ru run off in these kinds of precipitation events. So we have something to learn from nature here. How does nature manage stormwater? And um, this is a great diagram that just describes how wetlands work, that um, you know, when precipitation falls, 
it lands somewhere. And if we have swales and wetlands and rain gardens and places to catch these um, this precipitation, then there's many, many benefits, including um, more storage of water and slower re release of that water into our streams, especially during the dry times of the year. Um, that water is likely to become, um, it, it'll be more filtered by saturating into the soil. Um, and it doesn't just pick up pollutants and run off and head to the nearest stream. So you have cleaner water outflow. And then again, this provides such important habitat um, for all the different species that rely on water, um, which is everyone. Um, there, there's just a variety of, of habitat benefits that comes along with this um, type of water source. So we have a lot to learn um, from natural systems like that. And um, there's some green infrastructure techniques that I'd like to highlight. And I'm not gonna be able to get in depth with all of these. Um, each one has its own, it could have its own course uh, on its own. So we're just gonna breeze through these, um, but there are a lot and I'm hoping you'll get some inspiration on some ideas uh, for whatever your needs are. So first of all, when water lands on your roof, that's where it's still the cleanest. Um, so if you can capture it in gutters and downspouts, it, it can be diverted and remain clean and not just catch, uh, pick up the pollutants from your soil, from your driveway, from any other um, turf or uh, areas that, that might contain pollutants. So if you can keep it clean, that's the, the key right there. And then you can help divert it to where you need it. So um, it's not just your home as well. There's, there's barns, outbuildings, garages that will also need gutters and downspouts if you don't have them already. And then where do you want to direct that water is the next question. And there's a lot of different techniques out there, ways to store rain and use it. Um, you might have a raised bed or a container or um, a way to, to store that water for when you need it. Um, always check if you need a permit. That's a caveat there. If you live in the city, especially, you might need a, some kind of permit with the city. Um, another technique is called French drain. And um, these are more and more popular, just the kind of dry stream bed approach um, is, is one of the ways to do this. And basically, it's a way to capture that water and um, redirect it, but not just send it downhill. Uh, you don't want to direct it to your neighbor next door. You want to try to capture that water and let it percolate and saturate into the ground on your property. And then there are some really in innovative new materials that can help absorb water and infiltrate the soil below. So pervious pavers um, are, there's a variety of different materials and, and it's really cool to look into what your options might be if you do need to install a new driveway or um, pave an area in your yard. Um, maybe you want a patio or maybe you have a heavy use area for a small animal. Um, there's a lot of different materials that will um, help infiltrate the water, infiltrate the soil with um, surface water so that it doesn't just pick up pollutants and run downhill. Eco forms are an exciting form of green inf infrastructure with so much potential if you consider how much surface area exists on impervious roofs. Um, but it's best to get the advice of an architect or a builder with strong experience in these structures. You definitely want to make sure these get built properly to support um, the load and to drain well and, and not cause a problem for your structure. So um, these are really cool ideas. And there, again, there's so much potential here. So um, if you're building or thinking about just putting in a little shed and experimenting with an eco roof, that's another option for capturing stormwater and um, helping prevent water pollution. Bioswales and rain gardens are landscape features that are designed to collect stormwater runoff. And they give it time for the water to be naturally filtered by plants and soil. So again, we're capturing that runoff, we're preventing um, polluted runoff from heading downhill into the nearest stream. And um, one thing to be aware of is that a bioswale is generally not vegetated on the bottom and tends to be a deeper basin filled with soil and rock. While a rain garden, tends to be shallow and completely vegetated. 
So there's a slight difference between those two, but they serve very similar purposes. And here's a, a drawing from Benton Soil and Water Conservation District again, um, showing a rain garden design. And this serves a lot of purposes from water management to um, native plant habitat to aesthetics for human enjoyment. So um, all these plants are native on the drawing and um, you can imagine when this grows and um, gets established, it'll be a beautiful landscape feature. So um, these are some photos of different rain gardens and bioswales, just for your inspiration, hopefully. And in thinking about whether or not you can install or want to install a rain garden or bioswale on your property, um, you'll want to consider definitely a few things. Um, you'll want to check soil type and topography, make sure it makes sense for this area to be collecting water um, and that it's well draining. Um, you don't want to be within 10 feet of a foundation and um, definitely be mindful of existing structures or underground utilities. Um, and avoid locations with standing water because again, you want it to be well draining and you don't want, if it's already got standing water, it can't probably handle more water to be collected there. Um, and in terms of how to build one, there is a, a great land or a rain garden handbook that you can find online. Um, you can see the, the title of it there. And we have an older version of that, just about five copies um, printed here. So if anyone is really interested in getting their hands on a hard copy of the Rain Garden Handbook, um, you can put your name in the chat and we'll collect that and try to get one to you. All right. So if you do install something like a rain garden or a bioswale, or if you naturally already have a wet area on your property, there's um, some streamside plant communities and plant native plants that thrive with moist soils and um, along streams and other waterways. So um, I think Jan will be able to put a few links to some plant lists in our chat as well that you can um, copy over for your future use. And uh, we'll include a few lists of nurseries and other sources of native plants beyond our own native plant sale. Um, but I'll just breeze through a few photos of some native plants to be aware of. These again are the ones that are um, more in the streamside type of plant community. Um, this is a beautiful picture of Douglas spirea. You'll see that growing along roadsides and in ditches. Um, it loves water. Red osier dogwood does really well in moist um, soil and along waterways. Service berry. Um, this is an awesome plant in my mind because it, you'll find it along streams and waterways, but it's also very drought tolerant. So as we get wetter winters and drier summers, um, service berry is a hero in, in those conditions. It does really well. Um, mock orange and Pacific nine bark, they both have white flowers, but they're, they're different. The, the nine bark has, uh, that really prefers moist soils as well. You'll find it along streams. Um, mock orange prefers well-drained soils and, and will also um, be pretty drought hardy. In terms of upland plant communities, there's a variety of other plants that do well in drier upland areas. Um, Oregon grape, is one Oregon white oak is a is a beautiful tree that's really unique to this area um, in Washington. Uh, you'll see it more prevalent in Oregon, but in Washington, we're one of the few areas that still have um, thriving Oregon white oak populations. And some other upland species include golden currant, tall Oregon grape. They're both very drought tolerant. Um, Vine maple, unfortunately, we've sold out of in our sale, but it has beautiful foliage. Indian plum, it's an upland plant, usually an understory underneath um, forest canopies. So just a couple more slides here to give you some tips on planting. Of course, you want to choose the right plants for the right place in your property. Um, we can help with some advice on that. Um, and we have some, some links and some resources to help you peruse and, and think about that for yourself. 
Uh, we encourage folks to plant in the fall or early spring, um, as soon as the ground is workable in the spring. And that's just encouraging, you know, putting the plants in when the soil's moist is gonna really help that plant get established. Um, we really encourage mulching your plants and other bare ground just to help retain the moisture in the soil and get those plants started. Um, and then we do uh, think you should irrigate your plants for the first one to two years just to get those roots well established so that it can um, thrive for the rest of its life. So those are some, uh, just a few key tips as you think about planting. Um, here's just a helpful diagram to think about how to plant. If you have a bare root seedling, um, you don't want to do these other examples where you <laughs> Uh, might compromise the, the future of that plant. It may not ever, um, may not get off to a good start um, or last very long that way. So those are just a few tips. And um, with that, I'm gonna pass this on, pass the baton for presenting on to Dan Richardson, unless there's any quick questions. Jan, I don't know if you're talking or not, but um, I haven't seen any questions come up, but I haven't been looking either. Yeah, no questions that I've seen and no hands up. Um, yeah, so we can just keep keep rolling and we'll have a, like I said, a more dedicated um, Q&A session at the end too, so. Sounds good. All right, Dan, you're up. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Am I? Coming through. Yes. Excellent. So my task this evening is to introduce everybody to a program called Conservation Yard by Yard. Hope you can be seeing my pro uh, screen. It should say Conservation Yard by Yard. And um, I know that might sound a little dry, programmatic introduction, but we're going to try and keep it a little snappy here and. Um, and, and hopefully it will be intriguing to you. So what is back, uh, Yard by Yard? It's, it's sort of a backyard habitat program. I, I think of it as Backyard Habitat Plus, inspired by some of the other programs you may have heard of by, um, I think Audubon has one and Columbia Land Trust. So plus what? Well, you. So um, the idea is that we want to be looking at natural resources generally, and we'll talk about sort of our categories or how we do that. Habitat is definitely one of them, but it's not only about habitat. It's not just about um, turning your yard into a sanctuary for birds and bees and butterflies and whatnot. And who's it for? It's for everyone. So again, it's for you. And the program is really designed to be customizable and self-paced. So this is not a something where we come in and sort of say, you've got to do this or you must do that. It's, it's really about some ideas that we present or facilitate and you take on and uh, apply as you think best and, and have space for. So it's gonna bleed a little bit into sort of philosophy for a moment. What's the big idea? One of the ideas is that nature is not out there, it's um, around us. Right, uh, it's as close as a backyard, or front yard, a side yard, uh, or the five acres or ten acres you might be living on. So it's not just a sort of uh, a reserve at one of the national parks. It's it's nearby, and we're in, uh, interacting with it. And the way we interact with it matters. There's a fellow named Aldo Leopold once upon a time suggested that. Uh, one idea of how we interact with this living community around us um, is to be thinking ethically. And he, he defined what he called the land ethic essentially as anything that's good for this living community or supports the integrity of this living community, whether it's uh, adequate space or water or, or other, other needs um, is a good thing. And another idea that is sort of baked into this that Tova touched on is, is this backyard biodiversity, or as Douglas Ptolemy, the author, uh, argues, we have an opportunity 
as homeowners or landowners and really an ethical uh, need to be rebuilding some of the habitats that we have uh, fragmented just because there's a lot of us and, and we're really good at building things and paving things. And one other idea, one that's not really uh, maybe been fleshed out in other places in the program, but sort of baked into it uh, at some level is maybe thinking less of ourselves as this collection of labels that our culture sort of encourages, right? I belong to this club or I'm a member of that group or whatever. And, and less of that, less of I am this and more of I am here or to, make, to, to boil it down to a word is, is neighborliness. The idea here being that we're going to, uh, as Aldo might say, we're going to expand the idea of who our neighbors are. And, okay, sounds great. I know you're thinking, okay, you're very excited about this. How do I get started? You get started here. You start at this website, ucdwa.org slash yard by yard. And I'm gonna outline the process of what this program actually is. One is you read, you read and you think, and as hopefully some of you are doing, and, and I was doing while Tova was making the presentation, start sketching your, your yard or your property. Um, start thinking about it. Maybe go out and walk around and really try to observe. And on our website, we have a lot of references uh, that have um, articles and websites and things and to help start thinking about them. Uh, number two is you download this checklist, and we'll look at that a little bit more. The checklist is really the, the heart of the program. It's, it's the a series of things that we recommend and I guess kind of require if you're going to be certified. And it's, uh, it's your plans, your, your, your map, and you get to pick which things you will be incorporating into your place. And then you plan and act. So you sketch your property and you get going in terms of uh, planting or building or rearranging or adding, and you work at your own pace, right? This is not something that we're imposing. It's something that we're encouraging. So there's no rush. And we would strongly recommend, I would anyway, uh, there's a lot to gardening, right? There's a whole library of books of various kinds of gardening and property management, one thing at a time. So pick, pick something and work on it, grow it, cultivate it. And then you report back, me, and you have at least five practices checked off. I want to under, uh, you know, underline sort of at least. Um, we'll go through that a little bit more. And then site visit and a, and a, and a sign and your official. So that's kind of the process. Look at it. Take a look at the website. Take a look at the checklist. Take a look at your property. And then let's talk uh, after you get underway. And here is the checklist. You'll see at the top, there's a, a few things that we essentially require. And again, we're non-regulatory. So when we say require, we mean if you're gonna be sort of official in this program. Uh, one is, look, you, you can't sort of invite life to your property and then poison it. So it's really, you know, we, we really insist on a, a pesticide free yard. Uh, a couple of other things you got to do uh, practices across several categories. The categories are soil, water, food, and habitat. What about, you know, if you live out of town, you've got five acres in the backyard. Your backyard's bigger than mine. Well, then you have a fifth category. We're going to have a presentation on this. And the fifth category is wildlife interaction. So essentially, not just inviting life in and installing or, or integrating conservation uh, at your yard or your home, but also being a good neighbor. And, and that takes on a couple of different flavors depending on where you are. So one of our categories, this is what the checklist looks like. So here's water and you can see uh, there's boxes with different practices, like say uh, this one here at the uh, third one down, the lawn is allowed to go dormant in the summer or the lawn areas have been reduced or eliminated. Well, what does that mean? Again, this is self-paced and somewhat self-structured. So we're not gonna be out there measuring it in sort of lawn before and lawn after. It's, it's a little bit of, hmm, 
you need to take on the spirit of the program and decide what that means to, you know, to some degree. So there's water, there's food, uh, and it's really food for you and other things. So you'll see that, uh, for instance, one of the check items here is uh, companion crops grown in the garden, some allowed to bolt. You know, typical or, or traditional uh, American gardening um, spends a certain amount of effort saying, um, you know, be careful not to let such and such bolt. Well, yes, it doesn't taste so good to us, but it works great for a lot of uh, our smaller neighbors. Let's see, habitat is another category, obviously that's, that's at the heart of this in a lot of ways. Uh, and you'll see that there's a number of things and, and a lot of it really benefits or focuses on some amount of native plants as Pill was mentioning, whether it's trees and shrubs. And I do wanna say, if you, know, if, if you take nothing else out of this talk from, from my section anyway tonight, is that integrate some native shrubs onto your property. They're, they tend to be really hardy, they tend to be really beautiful, and they do a lot for wildlife, both structure and food, and they're also um, uh, rather lovely. Okay, this is the fifth category. Again, we'll have another uh, presentation that really digs into this soon. Uh, stay around for that, it's gonna be a good one. So let's see, when we're thinking about backyard habitat, often, at least, those of us at the, who, are, who are thinking about it as a program have this kind of bird's eye view in mind of, of you know, as you can see, small lots, a uh, few trees, neighborhoods, right? But many of us in the district and Klickadat and Skamini County live more like this kind of backyard where there's a, a, an acre here or several acres. So this kind of green dash circle, that's really the yard, right? Maybe a half an acre you know, winged it, that looks maybe a little shy of half an acre, but ab about that, that's a yard. And for our program, we're really focused on that scale. If you have this bigger area, this polygon and uh, uh, sort of the orange dashed lines, if you have three or five or 10 acres and you call that your backyard, then uh, you already have wildlife probably running through your place. And you may be thinking, I've got plenty of, plenty of wildlife. I don't need to invite any in. And to some degree, yeah, you're correct. You want to be, let's say, mindful about how you interact with your neighbors. And just like we need to be good human neighbors, we also need to be good neighbors to our, our sort of natural community. So it's a lot, right? It's like philosophy and program and all these checklists. What the heck? What do I do? Start where you are and do what you can. Uh, I would say that for any scale of property. And I put this picture up here because uh, as I was kind of preparing things. Um, this really is like, start anywhere. So I imagine somebody saying, well, I live in this apartment with a patio and you know, what does nature have to do with me? And I see this, I'm like, look at all these plants. You can imagine if this, this person had picked a selection of native plants, uh, looks like there's maples and other things, blossoming over uh, a growing season, this could actually be a small amount of habitat. And it's also lovely. It's also inviting human beings, which is kind of, I think, one of the unsung bits of sort of backyard habitat, which is, it really can work for us too. On the, on the left here, this, this uh, white sheet, this is a, uh, a screenshot of our web, part of our web page, that yard by yard web page. And you see there's some questions and some additional resources. And if you click on the additional resources, there's quite a few articles and books. So it really benefits you uh, if you have any interest to do some exploring. Even if you say, you know what, uh, I'm a free spirit. I, I just can't abide a checklist and a government program. That's fine. All right. We're non-regulatory. So go take a look at the resources here and do your own reading. Um, this is really about growing the community of people that are inviting nature into their, their homes and their lives. And Douglas Tomley has a relatively new book out and I, I have kind of hinted to some people that that would be a fine item to put on your Christmas tree. Here's a few observations from people that have already been in the Yard by Yard program, just very briefly. Here's one uh, on the screen, this, this 
uh, person lives on the west side of the Cascades. And you can see there's not zero lawn. There's still lawn here. And they still run around on the grass. But you can see this traditional uh, sort of uh, shrub planting or, or, or flower planting along the foundation there. Um, except these are native plants. So there's like oxalis and sword fern, some other things in there. And it, it looks very much like any sort of standard or traditional sort of planting, which I think is a good observation. You can also see she's trying to be a good neighbor by not letting some of her wild neighbors burrow under the, under the patio there or under the deck there. And here's another one. Uh, on the east side of the Cascades, actually in town, V very much in a neighborhood. You can see she just makes maximum use of her edges. There's little bits of lawn, but the edges along this walkway have uh, just a lovely selection of plants. And then along the edge of the yard in the street, there's a, a mix of shrubs and trees. So we've got sort of vertical diversity and a diversity of, of blooming things. And one other thing to note here is that while well, native plants are really the the, the queen of the, you know, the bell of the ball, so to speak. Um, there's plenty of place for appropriate non-native plants and still being sort of nature friendly. So you've got lavender, for instance, here, and a lot of our aromatic garden plants. Basically anything we might grow for food or medicine as a general rule tend to be um, generalist enough plants that a lot of our pollinators I don't mean just honeybees, right? But many of our several hundred species of native bee and other flying thing uh, can make use of them. So we can integrate things that are not strictly native and native and they work together. And so again, good use of edges, good use of um, sort of structural diversity and a variety of plants and that's that's really important. This diversity of plants is, is really key to um, sort of these micro habitats that we might make our yards into. Here's another person who is in the program before and after. So the picture on the left, it, you know, an autumn day in a, a, a very nice typical looking yard, a lot of lawn, nothing wrong with that. But after, after she's done some work or they have done some work, it's a different look. And it's not overgrown. It's not, you know, they didn't go crazy. It's not something you'd be embarrassed. It's, it's lovely. It's a, a garden that thrives for them. And it, it's sort of inviting. It's got these little rock lined pathways, but also inviting for many of these other uh, organisms and living things that uh, we would encourage. So to reiterate, the, the program is self-paced. You know, some people have contacted me and said, I'm done. I've got it. I've checked it off. I, I've been working on it for three years already, even before you had a program. And that's great. But you can start where you are and, and, and work with what you have. And there's no rush. Uh, you can learn as you go. You don't have to be an expert in gardening. You don't have to be an expert in native plants or anything in particular. Um, pick one thing is, and do some reading and, and think about it and implement it. Uh, you can do something whether it's a patio or like in this picture, you've got um, God, just what I think is a really attractive backyard. It's both attractive to people. Obviously it's, it's a sort of a brick paver. So a, a comfortable place, but then this huge structural and species diversity. You could do something, one could do something. One could start with a few potted plants, whether you live in an apartment or on five acres and then just do one thing at a time. So one more thing about uh, yard by yard, we know that it's good for um, wildlife and good for, again, the bunnies and the birds and the butterflies, and it's good for your sort of larger natural community. It's also good for you. And I don't mean good for you like in an eat your vegetable sense. I mean, it's good for you. It's good for one. So you can imagine this person strolling, you know, happy day strolling along the path in the Lotta Brunner Valley here in Switzerland. It's great, they're out in nature. But we have an increasing, or and we have an increasing number of studies, and this is really a, a burgeoning area of research that um, really underline how important and valuable being outdoors, sort of in analog space rather than digital space, how important that is for people. 
or as this one researcher said, it's not just a nice to have, nature is not just nice to have, it's a have to have for physical health and cognitive function. And here's some reading. So quick, take a screenshot uh, or, or write this down. There's a couple of good books here. The Comfort Crisis is a lousy title by Michael Easter, but it's a really good book. And it has five or six ideas that he kind of integrates. And one of them is this need to be outdoors. And he actually gives a, a sort of a prescription and it's like 20 minutes a day. Um, I think it's 20 minutes a day, one day a month and three days a year in a row. Let me back up. So again, a beautiful scene, Lauterbrunn, Switzerland. What could, be, what could be nicer than this? But this is not really what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, okay, you need to take a vacation and go away out there into nature. I'm, I'm really saying yard by yard is one entree into this larger idea that it's good for us to be fully human by being outdoors and analog active. And it doesn't mean just this, so that's fine. It really means like this, right? Being outside, touching the ground, throwing leaves and having, having a fine time. Maybe it's a lunch break where you walk through the park. Maybe it's uh, you know, some opportunity just to be outdoors. So questions, I mean questions right this second. I mean, hopefully you're inspired, you're fired up, you're ready to do this. Well, okay, great. You'll see the yard by yard link. There's a lot of information there. And if you just got to reach out and grab somebody, um, here's an email. So yes to things like plant questions, happy to do that. Uh, happy to have conversations or give you my two cents for whatever that's worth on these sorts of ideas. Uh, no, I, we don't have time at UCD or funding to really like draw you up a landscaping plan. So I would encourage you to do the sketching exercise uh, and the walk around your own property exercise um, and put your own eyes on it. Or if that's too much, you know, you can always, of course, Google up. There are people that do this professionally. Uh, if you have feedback on the program, yeah, I definitely want to hear that. It is, as I like to think of it, it's a living program. It's about nature, but it's also sort of a brand new program. It's been around less than a year for us. Um, so that's yard by yard. So if you're wondering if it's for you, yes. All right, if you're waiting for permission to embark on the journey, I want to say, here you go. You have my permission to embark. Get on it. It's your journey, but you can share it. Share it with us. Um, send us some feedback. Like I said, it's a new program. You know, if you, you want to challenge something I have on the checklist or think we've missed something or could add it, you're probably right. There, uh, certainly, we could probably uh, do some uh, addition and subtraction over time. And uh, with regard to a living program, I, I, you know, I have a couple of ideas that I'm tossing around in my own head. Oops. Uh, one is maybe adding a sixth category, maybe community, basically like um, volunteer time. Um, getting, getting us to engage with uh, nature just beyond our backyard, maybe with our neighbors somehow. Um, considering maybe a spring garden tour. So if you have an interest in, in either participating or hosting or, or just being involved, uh, by all means, do send me an email. Uh, and you know, who knows, maybe an Instagram account, someplace where we share photos uh, of work in our yards would be appropriate. We do have a Facebook page. Um, I'm wondering if Instagram, something like that might be a little uh, more um, uh, user-friendly and, and quick to, to share photos on. At any rate. That's yard by yard. I hope it's uh, hope it's of interest. Thanks, thanks for your attention this evening. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I think um, we are kind of right on schedule. Um, if there's an, any pressing, urgent question right now for Dan, we could cover it quickly. But then we can also move on to Todd. Any raised hands out there, or I don't see anything in the chat. Now, I'm sure somebody has a question they want to throw out. <laughs> somebody is like, thinks I'm, I'm, I'm off base or um, has an itch that just has to be scratched. So you got 
30 seconds to fire it up. All right. Yeah. Well, well you can always re reach out to UCD or to Dan at ucdwa.org. All right. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thank you. We're excited to have Todd Jacobson here today. Um, he's our local conflict specialist with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. So if you don't have his number, try to get it. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Todd. <laughs> Thanks, Joa. Can you uh, go ahead, can you see my screen? Right. Yeah, we can, Todd. Yeah, well, I'm happy to be here today. And I know, you know everyone's talked about how to enhance your yard for nature and for uh, wildlife. And there's a kind of a natural paradox that comes with that. How do you create wildlife habitat in your backyard um, while at the same time avoiding conflicts with those species? So I'll chat about that with you today and hopefully give you some tips to, to avoid conflict with wildlife in your backyard. So there are probably, you know, a lot of you who might be interested in attracting a, flo a flock of, of crossbills to your yard, but you know, maybe you don't necessarily want a bear to be running away with your, your bird fear that you might have out there. Maybe you want to see deer, you know, some, some nice newer black-tailed deer out your back window as they're browsing in the oaks, but you don't necessarily want a cougar following those deer into your backyard, or you don't necessarily want those deer browsing on your prized strawberries. Um, you know, in creating a backyard habitat, you might come up with the idea of installing a, a rock pile in your yard for, for small um, invertebrates and for you know reptiles and amphibians, but you don't necessarily want that rock pile inhabited by you know certain smelly neighbors. So those are just some examples of some some potential conflicts that could occur when you when you create wildlife habitat. And just to take a step step back, I know this has kind of been touched on a few times today, but you know, why are we creating backyard wildlife habitat? Uh, urbanization is, is kind of a, a big threat to biodiversity and um, species, you know, across the world. Um, it, within the gorge, you know, we have a lot, a lot of threatened and endangered sensitive species. Uh, we have western gray squirrel, we have fishers, western pond turtles, Oregon spotted frogs, large mountain salamanders, northern spotted owls, and furge and socks, just to name a few um, species of concern. You know, and as I think as Tova mentioned earlier, even neotropical migrants, while they're not, you know, birds, while they're not listed as threatened or endangered, you know, their numbers are declining. So, um, you know, these are, we have existing residences, um, you know, in the half acre size or, or less. Th those dwellings aren't currently identified as a, as a large threat to species in the gorge, but remember, every little bit of habitat helps. And while you might not be able to provide, you know, directly provide, western pond turtle or fisher habitat in your smaller backyard keep in mind that all levels of ecosystems are interconnected even if you're you know not directly benefiting one species so you could be providing habitat for insects which in turn um, provide feed um, for neotropical migrants so it's, it's all interconnected you're not just it's not just one one level that you're affecting another reason to create backyard wildlife habitat is for insect pest reduction in your garden um, and also to attract pollinators to your yard to enhance what you already have growing there. Uh, so birds, small mammals, reptiles, and all those prey on a lot of non-native garden pests that you might be having issues with. Um, pollinators, like I said, also help your fruit trees, they'll help vegetables, they'll help your native plants that you're, that you're trying to grow in your, in your backyard. People also wanna you know, have, have backyard wildlife habitat just for their own enjoyment. Um, I think birds in particular are one wildlife group of species that you can see, you know, directly in your backyard, you can see a high diversity um, when in a small space just by having the right habitat. And this is a great way to get uh, people, especially children, um, active and, and interested in the outdoors. To have backyard or have wildlife right in your backyard. So if you're creating backyard wildlife habitat, just keep in mind that you, with habitat, it's probably going to come what come wildlife. Just like field of dreams, you know, if, if you build it, they will come. Maybe not baseball players, but you, you'll definitely have wildlife showing up if you create the habitat for them. So again, most of this focuses on a backyard scale of half acre or less, but you know, this still applies to the folks of you know a little bit larger parcels as well. 
keep in mind that you know we're not trying to create Yellowstone in your backyard. We're not going to have grizzly bears, you know, eating um, moose in your backyard. That's not that's not what we're going for here. So just have realistic expectations of, of what you might see, uh, what you want in your yard. You know, with, within the city limits in the surrounding areas, those are, those areas aren't really suited for attracting most medium and large size native animals. I know we have we have deer in White Salmon, we have deer in Goldendale, most of these you know small you know kind of rural towns in Clickadat and Skamania County. Um, you, you're going to have these species, um, but it doesn't mean it's it's ideal for them to live there. You no, know, a lot of deer, most of these smaller issues do have problems with deer. Um, browsing on vegetation that, that people really don't want to happen. Um, you know, cougars don't make great yard guests either. Um, you don't really want a cougar sitting on your porch, although it does happen from time to time. You know, another thing with deer in these urban areas, I think this year alone, I think I've been called out on three different um, deer issues where deer have been tangled up in people's fencing or clothesline or things like that. They've got it wrapped around their antlers. And there's a whole bunch of instances where this happened where I don't even get called on. So th these, these animals, like they live in and amongst us, but it's not ideal. We don't necessarily want to be catering to those species within these smaller kind of town settings. Outside of town, you've got 20, 40 acres. That's that's a, a different story. But keep that in mind of talking about these smaller scale backyard habitat programs. Also keep in mind that your desires might not match those of your neighbor. You know, you may really like raccoons and you've got a perfect snag tree. You've created a, a hollow in that, you know, raccoons might like to nest and you've got um, a lot of fruit trees, cherry trees, attract raccoons to your yard. But your neighbor, you know, might have those same raccoons nesting in their attic space and really is having that. There might be having a conflict with those raccoons. And so by attracting raccoons, you could be, um, you know, that neighbor might be trapping the raccoons at the same time that you're bringing them in. And it might be harmful for the raccoons in the long run if you're if you're bringing them in and your neighbor's trying to remove them. Um, can, that's just, just apply to raccoons. Keep that in mind for all wildlife you might be attracting. Um, also keep in mind that you know, wildlife aren't computer programs that follow set rules. They're, they're wild animals, they're gonna do their thing. We can generally predict kind of how, how wild animals are gonna react, but they're, you know, they're still wild. They're gonna move from place to place. They're not gonna stay within the boundaries of your yard. They're gonna go elsewhere as well. Uh, and lastly, you know, just to, by, by avoiding attracting certain species to their to your yard, it doesn't mean that you devalue them. It doesn't mean that they're any less valuable to have around. It's just, it's probably better for the, in that, it's in the animal's best interest not to attract them to a smaller backyard setting. There's plenty of other places where those animals are, are, are better suited. So this you know, graphic just helps you keep in mind you might be creating habitat, say for you know um, for mice. You've got you've got you know the right grasses and shrubs and the seed producing plants that mice like to feed on. But in attracting mice, you're also probably going to attract larger carnivores that feed on mice and, and all the way up the food chain. This is a very simplified version. And you know in, in the natural environment, you've got food chains and food webs that are vastly more complex than this. And you could have a variety of species coming in that you might not even predict based on what you've attracted into your yard. So if you're, if you're creating backyard wildlife habitat, you know, you're going to have wildlife. And so I'm going to go over some, some tips on how to prevent conflicts with those animals when they do show up. First thing to keep in mind is that prevention is a lot easier than reaction. And a good example of that is our, our slogan that a fed bear is a dead bear. It's a lot easier, a lot better off to prevent attracting black bears to your yard by doing some of the things that we'll talk about in the yard by yard program here in just a minute. Um, once a bear finds a food source and becomes habituated to that food source, it's really hard to break that habit. And a lot of times it'll end up costing that bear its life because it gets into trouble and it's just, it's, it's associated, you know, your yard with food and becomes a problem. Um, keep in mind that, you know, recognize conflicts when they occur and when they, when they don't. If you might, you might have deer in your yard and you may, you may see a cougar come in and a cougar might kill a deer in your yard. Um, that, that's wildlife for you. Um, but in most cases, a sighting or, or an instance like that doesn't constitute a conflict, doesn't constitute an emergency. Um, you know, the whole gorge and really most of Washington is wildlife habitat on a larger landscape scale. We do have cougars and bears and deer. Um, you know, you might not see them in your small half acre parcel, but those animals are, are using this area. They're using every square inch basically of the gorge and they may at some point 
walk through your, your yard, um, even though you don't anticipate it. In addition, um, another tip to, to avoiding conflict, and this is probably the primary, the most, probably the most important one, is that when you're creating backyard wildlife habitat, you want to attract things like birds. Just you know, try to mimic the natural environment. Plant seed and, and nectar-bearing flowers and um, snags that attract insects, rather than putting out artificial supplements. Um, so for example, you know, bird food, deer food, bigfoot food. We don't want to be necessarily attracting those things into our yard as supplemental resources. Um, and that that's tends to be when you you get things like bears coming in to finding you know supplemental sources. That's probably the number one or number two bear conflict I have is when bears find people's residential hummingbird feeders and you know regular bird food feeders. They get into a lot of trouble when when by well-intentioned people trying to attract birds into their yard. Um, Keep wildlife wild when you're attracting wild, you know, when you've got habitat in your backyard. We don't want wildlife to become habituated to humans. There are plenty of, of examples, you know, when, when deer become habituated to humans, it can become more aggressive. Um, they can also lose their fear and become less wary and are more likely to maybe get killed by a cougar in the yard or something like that. Uh, and sometimes this just means chasing the animals out of your yard. Um, which seems counterintuitive to attracting wildlife, but sometimes just you just need to haze animals out, out of your yard so they're not not used to being around people. And this is again, probably more on the larger animal scale. scale. You know, when, when you've got backyard wildlife habitat, you might, you, you've got some target species in mind. I, I suggest focusing on, on birds, you know, neotrop, neotropical migrants and, and resident birds. Tra probably not turkeys. Turkeys can tend to be problematic when you, when you get them gathering in large flocks in your property. But you know, you wanna be targeting insects and pollinators, small mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. But be prepared when you're doing that, that you might also get non-target wildlife using your habitat. You might create a rock pile that's great for, you know, fence lizards or, you know, some other small invertebrates. But you might also get rattlesnakes using that rock pile. You might get California ground squirrels using that rock pile as well. So just keep in mind that you might get something you didn't intend to show up in your yard. And with that, just adjust accordingly. Um, make modifications if you've got something using your habitat that you don't necessarily want in your backyard. And then, you know, seek assistance if, if you need. Give, give me a shout if you are having potential wildlife conflict issues in your yard. Uh, so Dan kind of gave you an example or pulled up the, what the yard by yard um, checklist looks like. And I've pulled a couple um, a couple of the checklist items off of that. So the, all these things you see here on my screen are things that are written into the yard by yard checklist. Uh, and then I'm gonna kind of point out a couple of key things to keep in mind while you're implementing these, these checklist items that we've suggested for you. I know in the, in the food section, there's a uh, requirement or a, a potential checkbox to have fruit producing trees or shrubs or first foods. Um, which is great. Um, but one something to keep in mind when you're doing that, though, is to keep you pick up any fallen fruit that shows up on the ground, and that's mainly to help avoid attracting bears and other large animals that might feed on that fruit. Uh, it is one of the things that Dan mentioned quite quite often was that you know have have native species in your, in your yard, plant native um, plants. When you're doing that, try to try to select some deer resistant plants. And I don't think we have a a list of deer resistant plants on the conservation districts plant sale, but that's something, you know, compare, compare lists. If, if there's a species that, a plant that you really want, um, you know, you have deer in your area, you know, cross-reference it with some other internet resources and see if that plant, it happens to be deer resistant. Otherwise you may be planting a lot of things to over and over again as a deer browse them. Uh, on the, on the checklist, uh, the habitat checklist, uh, it suggests, you know, planting three or more different plant species that flower throughout the year. And when you do that, try to select seed producing or, or flower from you know, nectar producing plants for birds and pollinators. Another easy one is to remove invasive blackberries. Not only does removing blackberries you know, reduce the competition with native species, but it also serves as a uh, reduce to reduce a bear attractant. I've had plenty of instances where blackberries are drawn to a yard to feed on the blackberries, especially since they're tend to be you know, producing fruit later on in the season at lower elevations. Another uh, checklist item is to have a corner of your yard um, allowed to allow that to go wild and be undisturbed. So don't be mowing it or spraying that. 
And when you do that, I'd suggest, you know, if you do have a section of your yard like that, don't have it, you know, directly next to an area where you have livestock. One of the things that I work with a lot of livestock producers on is keeping their immediate livestock area free of shrubs and brush that might hide, um, you know, a, a carnivore that might prey on their livestock animals. So keep those areas at free, at least if you're going to be implementing, um, you know, this, this wild corner of your yard. Uh, another checklist item has to do with um, spaying and neutering domestic cats and keeping them indoors in early mornings and late evenings. And that's kind of a two-pronged um, approach. One, it protects birds, mammals, reptiles, things that the cats might prey on, but it also protects the cats itself. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but cats, you know, they're outdoors at night. Um, it's not uncommon for those cats to be killed by coyotes or cougars in the area. I've alluded to this a few times, but having a rock pile or a dry stack rock wall or something brush pile, some sort of brush pile into the landscaping provides cover and shelter for a lot of different species. Again, when you're doing this, be mindful of the possibility of things like rattlesnakes or California ground squirrels or skunks occupying these areas. A couple of things you can do if you're implementing these kind of brushy, shrubby areas is to select, you know, maybe rocks that allow for smaller crevices or smaller reptiles and insects can use. Um, another suggestion would be to lay down uh, a mat of chicken wire underneath the rocks to keep some of these smaller mammals from burrowing and creating these larger crevices that they would need for uh, ideal shelter. Another great thing to have on your property is a, a year-round water feature on the site. If you're doing that, uh, I would suggest try to, um, especially if it's an artificial water source, if you're creating water, like a, um, a pond or a bath, try to keep um, the water flowing and, and the, keep a fresh supply of water in there. And that's mainly to help prevent the spread of disease from animal to animal. Um, people who have little, I've seen people who have little, little buckets of water on the property for deer to drink, and those deer are constantly drinking from the same water source and potentially swapping um, bacteria or viruses that way. So have a, try to keep a fresh supply of water for, for you know, clean um, drinking water for those animals. Within this yard by yard program, there's also a very specific wildlife interaction section that I've worked with uh, Dan to develop um, in this certification program. And this is really keying in on um, avoiding conflicts with wildlife. And probably one of the top um, goals of this is to have all, all hobby livestock, all livestock enclosed in a four-sided structure with a roof and have those animals in there every night from before dusk until after dawn. I've probably investigated, oh, 40 or 50 livestock attacks um, by carnivores in Clickadat, Scrimini, and Clark County, probably more than that. And I think all but one or two of those happened at night to animals that were unpenned. They were left out in a pasture. So just by taking this small step of penning your hobby livestock up in a, you know, you've got two or three goats, pen them up in a, in a structure with a roof. And that does, you know, a ton of work to prevent um, the likelihood of them being attacked by something like coyote or cougar or even domestic dogs. I would again suggest removing artificial bird, bird feeders, which can potentially attract bears. And again, remember, a fed bear is a dead bear. Once a bear gets attracted to a source, it's really hard to break that habit and it requires a lot of work and potentially a lot of risk for that bear. Keep your pets indoors or within fenced in areas, especially again between dusk and dawn. The vast majority of, of conflicts that I've work with where, you know, something like a coyote or cougar is killed or cat or dog or, or when those animals are left out at night. Or uh, in, interestingly, when, when people let their small dogs out to go to the bathroom at night, those dogs might smell one of these animals in their yard and go and confront them. And it doesn't usually end well for the small, you know, small dogs. So if you're letting your animals out at night, have them within a small fence scenario or take them out on a leash at night to use the bathroom. And those are just simple things you can incorporate to help prevent conflicts in your backyard. If you do have beehives and compost bins, you know, recognize that those things aren't really movable um, and they're really hard to protect, but probably the most effective way of protecting those things is to use electric fencing. Some of you may have seen some of the electric fencing that I've distributed around white salmon to help protect beehives. Uh, that's the most effective way of keeping bears away and, and bears really don't like electric fencing. So if you have a food source that's smelly attractant um, that you can't move, you can't enclose in a, in a secure fence with the roof, you know, Give those electric fencing option a try. This is just to kind of come back to what I was showing or telling you earlier about keeping livestock pinned up at night. This is an actual example that I dealt with out in 
Washugo, where a gentleman had even had a, a barn but didn't lock his animals up at night. We've got a cougar on the left, you know, just staring down a goat and a llama on the right side of the picture. And that cougar ended up killing that goat. Um, had the animal been locked up at night, I don't, you know, this really wouldn't have been an issue. Um, there's been a lot of talk about having um, gardens and, and growing herbs, things that um, you might harvest. And if you're doing that, I strongly recommend having some sort of a deer proof barrier, either like a little hoop house or chicken wire or an eight foot tall deer fence surrounding those areas. Uh, you know, deer are going to browse the, your garden, especially as it gets drier in the summer. You know, most of their native forage is pretty dried up and crispy and not very palatable. They're going to switch to something that's irrigated and lush and that's normally your garden. So keep that, uh, prevent conflicts by keeping your garden items, you know, secured from deer. As I mentioned earlier, keep uh, wildlife from becoming habituated, namely turkeys and deer. Um, don't su provide supplemental feed. That just attracts these animals in your yard, which can then attract larger carnivores that might prey on these species. With trash and compost, again, if, they're, if they are mobile, secure them inside in a structure. If you're one of those people who doesn't have um, regular trash, trash service, please don't you know, throw your trash in the back of your pickup truck and for, you know, for the next dump run in a couple months. Keep that secured, stored somewhere where a bear can't get at it. And then as, as Dan uh, mentioned earlier in one of the, the photos that someone of someone in, who had implemented the yard by yard program, keep the crawl spaces underneath your house and decks and outbuildings closed off with siding, wire mesh, anything to prevent uh, animals from occupying those areas. And they, they will, especially in Klickitat County, we seem to have an abundance of of skunks, they really like to burrow underneath or, or use those you know spaces underneath your buildings as uh, to occupy and doesn't uh, doesn't usually go too well when you've got a stinky skunk right underneath your house. So keep those areas walled off from wildlife. There's plenty of other spaces for them to occupy, uh, but yeah, you don't really want them right underneath your house. And I just want to wrap up this um, presentation here about the wildlife. Um, on, on how you can get the resources you need to help you out. Um, you know, there's plenty of resources on the internet for, for help. We have a Living with Wildlife page where we offer fact sheets about different species. There's a, a whole page on raccoons and a whole page on coyotes, and there's a preventing conflict section for each of those animals. There's a lot of other internet resources. I mean, a simple internet search will get you a lot of results on species. Most of them are reliable. Some are some are less reliable, but you know you can always check on the internet for for help. We also have a, a customer service staff. Customer service staff, they're here to help you. Our customer service office for Southwest Washington is based out of Ridgefield. So if you have wildlife concerns or questions, go ahead and give those folks a call. Um, and if it's something that needs to be elevated to maybe the conflict specialist level, they'll always they can provide you information, but then they might direct that call to me for additional resources. Uh, I've got the number listed here. You can go ahead and write that down. Um, you can also contact them at teamridgefield at dfw.wa.gov. Um, also go ahead and contact those folks. If you have like larger conflicts that you're not sure how to handle or if you have commercial crop damage, a good portion of what I do for Fish and Wildlife is, is dealing with commercial crop damage from livestock. So that's a great resource for you there. Um, if you have a non-emergency dangerous wildlife conflict, uh, let's say you maybe you had a, an encounter with a, a cougar in your backyard, or you had repeated repeated issues with a bear when coming by. We have a um, WDFW enforcement dispatch call center, and those that, that the, they staff that call center uh, seven days a week from eight to five. So go ahead and give those folks a call if it, that's the type of conflict you have. Um, they'll dispatch the the information out to our enforcement officers in the area, as well as myself, to help resolve whatever wildlife conflict issue that you might be having. That's maybe a more urgent deal. And then, as always, if you have an emergency wildlife issue, you need you need immediate response and immediate assistance. If there's a threat to to life or property that's immediate, call nine one one. That's the fastest way to get um, your needs out to you know enforcement staff in the area. Yeah, I'll, I'll take any questions that folks may have. Um, yeah. Thanks, Todd. Any questions out there? All right. 
I actually have a question, Don. Yeah, go ahead. Tell me about uh, bird feeders and when you feel they're okay. Um, you know, can I put a couple up in my backyard if I have, you know, live in a neighborhood or do you feel like they're always kind of problematic? In general, um, even if you're in a neighborhood, I would probably advise it. You know, bears have, they're like walking stomachs and they, their sense of smell is about 2,100 times stronger than a human's. Um, I've had actually had bears in my yard, but before I knew better, that knocked over a bird feeder and I live, you know, on the edge of town here in Klickitat. Um, the, probably the one time when you're generally, you're probably safe to put up a bird feeder is probably between late, late November, early December and in April. You know, in theory, bears should be hibernating during those times. Um, I've got some bears right now that have decided that they'll, you know, forego hibernation for some easy calories are still sticking around. But in general, the winter, it's okay by, you know, by mid-April, early mid-April, make sure you have those bird feeders, including hummingbird feeders. They can smell the sugar in those feeders, have those things pulled down because they're, you know, there's a good chance the bears, you know, can smell those and, and they'll be hungry when they come out of hibernation. So they can get more calories out of a bird feeder in a short amount of time than they could probably get in a week worth of, week's worth of foraging in the spring. So that's a great question. Thank you. Well, we'll go ahead and get started with Chris Shadell. And as I mentioned in the beginning, she um, by day works at Hood River Soil and Water Conservation District, um, similar to us, but over in Hood River there. And um, here we're seeing her home on the Washington side. And so she'll tell us about her participation in Yard by Yard and um, some of the challenges and successes she's been through. Go ahead, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tova. Yeah, so my name is Chris Shadell, and I am a resident of Bingen um, here in town. And um, as Tova mentioned, I am also uh, an employee of the conservation district on the Oregon side in Hood River County. So if any of you are Hood River residents, um, you know, you can, you, I would be the person you would call um, to ask any of these questions about any of these practices or implementation or site prep, any of those things. Um, I'm also not strict about who I help. So if you ever have questions specifically for me, I'll happily take an email or a call. Um, more than welcome to reach out. Uh, we also have a plant sale, not to steal Underwood's Thunder. We do them differently. Uh, and so you are more than welcome wherever you are to visit um, our plant sale webpage and order plants from us, um, no problem there. So anyway, um, I participated in the Yard by Yard program this spring. I mean, I guess, honestly, in reality, I've kind of um, on some level been thinking about these things and start beginning to implement and do site prep and trying and failing and trying and failing and trying and succeeding and then failing again. Um, for about six years on this property um, in Bingen. Um, I just wanna sing a little bit of praise for um, the Yard by Yard um, program, as well as like any sort of backyard habitat program. Um, I love these programs for so many reasons. Um, one of which being, and um, you know, going last, I'm gonna be echoing a lot of points already that's been made by Tova, Dan and Todd. Um, but these programs are so scalable. Success is so accessible. Um, you know, whether you have 40 acres and live in a very wild space or you're renting an apartment, um, whether you're in a neighborhood and just have a health strip between a sidewalk and a roadway, um, you know, uh, whatever the scale, these programs are so scalable and success is so accessible. Um, and to steal kind of what Todd said, you know, um, if you build it, they will come. Um, certainly in the context of macroinvertebrates or pollinators or beetles, um, you know, uh, these things aren't elk. They don't need overwintering ground and hundreds of miles of undisturbed habitat. You know, their ranges, uh, you know, can be a few hundred meters. You can provide everything they need in a small space. Um, and to me, this is so hopeful um, on so many ways. I think 
um, in a world where things seem kind of overwhelming and sometimes we feel a little bit hopeless, um, in this context, there's always work to be done. There's always something we can do on whatever scale it is. And truly, truly, like if you build it, they will come. Because um, really what this is getting at is um, zooming out into the landscape level um, and building that habitat connectivity. Um, and so there's always something we can be a part of. Our hands can always be busy. Um, so it's scalable on um, you know, the size on what we do and what we're working with. It's also scalable on the practices we choose to implement. You know, you can start really small and um, start learning what you're excited about, start doing these trials. Um, otherwise, you can go big and just do a huge installation. Um, you know, it, whatever you want to do, you can start picking practices that are exciting to you and that motivate you. And I think I really encourage uh, you to start there and like what um, you find is exciting, that will serve you well in the project implementation. Um, so anyway, I just want to talk briefly about my experience with Yard by Yard, um, kind of how I approached it in my um, yard and the practices I chose. Um, and then I kind of want to um, showcase some of um, the practices I installed that really feel like successes in my garden um, that I yeah like to showcase to you. Um, and then kind of my thoughts for the future. Um, so anyway, this is kind of off the cuff, but um, yeah, here we go. We'll get into it. Um, so I had to go to the real estate website to dig these photos up, but I wanted to show you all kind of what I was working with when I uh, when we approached this property. And again, I want to reiterate, you don't need to be a landowner. There's, um, don't take that as the baseline, but um, this was my scenario and the one I'm showing you. Um, but certainly I did things long before I had, was a homeowner. Um, Anyway, um, I wanted to show you what we were approaching, um, and we were kind of working with a blank slate. Um, that's kind of another reason I love these backyard habitat, yard by yard programs, is it really focuses on um, the assessment of what you have, what you're working with, um, you know, uh, the abiotic factors, your aspect, um, the weather, your soil types. Um, those kind of things, you know, I'm in Bingen, our whole property is south facing, very exposed, we're river level, uh, we're kind of the banana belt, super hot, super dry in the summers, you know, our sand, our soils are shallow, they're um, rocky, if they are deep, it's Missoula flood sand, and they drain like a sieve, you know, very little organic matter, um, very hard to uh, maintain water retention. Um, so those are kind of some of the things I had to think about. You know, um, it also, uh, the kind of assessment got me to focus on starting at my front door, what was in the immediate vicinity of my house, um, you know, within that 10 feet, um, you know, going out to, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet, and then um, we have, you know, two and a half acres. And so kind of looking at the bigger um, scope of our property. So these backyard habitat programs kind of get you thinking um, the physical space that you're working within. Um, it also gets you kind of thinking of the vertical space. Um, and what I mean by that is kind of what's happening within your soils under the ground level, um, what's happening at the soil surface, what your shrubs, your bigger trees, your canopy, um, and what those things are offering and what they're lacking. Um, in terms of your goals and kind of context. The other thing it gets you thinking about um, in addition to space is uh, time. So kind of throughout the seasons. And um, clearly I think you guys will take away from this that um, I'm very passionate about native plants, plant communities, as well as um, macroinvertebrates and beneficial insects. Those are kind of my two things that make me tick. Um, but you know, it kind of gets you thinking um, you know, what are we offering those early emerging insects in February and March? Um, what do they have when they wake up for uh, food sources? You know, what's your big 
nectar buffet in the early spring? And then as we start to dry out in June, July, August, what are you offering in terms of um, food? And then, you know, as they, um, you know, go into fall and need overwintering ground and hibernation spaces, um, what are you providing? So, you know, kind of in the context of seasons, you also start thinking about things in terms of life cycle and what they need at each stage, you know, in terms of reproduction, overwintering, forage, those kind of things. Um, all those things, these, um, all life needs to survive, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so basically this is what we were working with, primarily grass, a big juniper bush, dry space, blank slate. So, okay, I'll get into kind of um, the uh, practices I went through and some things along the way. Um, so for soils, we really, again, you know, one of my challenges is that we have dry, low organic matter soil. Um, so really building that organic matter and water retention capabilities was important to me. Um, I think a theme throughout my presentation will be um, be resourceful and be cheap. You don't need to buy anything to do this. You don't need to have um, a big bank account. In fact, I think that uh, hinders our creativity when we do. So, um, you know, in terms of mulch, call an arborist. They're usually happy to dump a load in your uh, driveway if they're in the neighborhood. Um, if you're doing brush clearing for fire mitigation or you have fruit trees that you're pruning, you know, um, I think Underwood has a chipping program or you can rent a chipper, um, you know, use those wood chips. Um, don't spend money. Um, so yeah, it, for soils, I chose mulch um, and then also compost. And I guess I should clarify that compost to me refers to like a really active intentional process where materials are composting. That's not what I have. I have a um, place where organic matter goes um, to stay out of the landfill and, um, you know, eventually probably you know, return to the soil. Um, Todd's presentation was amazing. I, there's a lot of things I realize I am not doing or um, doing poorly, but I have lots of space to improve in my wildlife interactions, um, which you will also see a little bit later. But I do have a space where my yard debris go and they don't go to the compost. Um, let's see, for water, again, we are hot, we are dry. If you're gonna be in my yard, you have to be tough and you have to be drought tolerant. Um, that was a serious lesson learned the first two years in my yard where I wanted to put raspberries and dahlias in. And uh, that failed almost instantly. Um, in our food garden, I use automatic timers because I'm lazy and forgetful. Um, we use drip line because I am also lazy and don't like weeding. Um, I didn't focus too much on the lawn um, aspects because what we have would be a loose definition of the word lawn, but we do allow that lawn space to go unwatered and go dormant in the summer. Um, so this is clearly water, I think, is a place for future that I would like to focus on and learn more on. If I'm putting a plug in for Underwood to do another workshop, I would love to uh, learn how to retain large quantities of water that are meaningful um, off my roof during the wet season so that that water actually can kind of put a dent in my bill because I am also cheap. Um, so, okay. Um, food, I start getting a little more excited about the uh, um, practices here. Um, you know, we have a vegetable garden where we did have to build a deer fence um, to allow that to exist. As Todd mentioned, it's eight feet with kind of a two foot bar on top. Um, you know, our property was blessed with a lot of um, fruit producing trees. Um, so we have apricots, plums, apples that, you know, create kind of a summer bounty. I will put a plug in. Um, uh, my one reluctance with fruit producing trees is if you are adjacent orchards, you need to be a good neighbor and not harbor pests. Um, in the spirit of not 
um, creating a problem that um, promotes pesticide use and per, um, endangers someone's livelihood. So please be wary of that if you are in the vicinity of orchards. It's really, really, really hard to manage backyard fruit trees for diseases and um, insect pests um, on that small of a scale. Um, if you are adjacent, just, you know, there's plenty of experts growing beautiful fruit in this region. You can let them do it. Um, and you can pick some other things that don't host those pests. Um, herb garden, that was a big one that I'm gonna showcase in just a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, again, the fruit trees and uh, our property also had a lot of um, native plants that are food producing, um, bountiful oak trees, elderberries, miners, lettuce, wild onions, um, all of these kind of things are abundant in our yard. Um, let's see here, habitat. So clearly you can see this is where I really chose to focus and what makes me tick. Um, a lot of these things kind of went hand in hand. Um, you know, I will say, uh, you know, that was excellent to hear about the water source. I was kind of going to um, just mentioned that I think that um, when you kind of really want to go to like the next level in backyard habitat, uh, supplying water, I think, um, does bring it to that next level, especially where I am and water is pretty scarce. It's kind of a limiting factor. Um, but certainly, you know, there's lots of rocks, um, native shrubs that bloom throughout the season. Um, native bunch grasses. I don't know if you can see that in the middle of the bunch grasses hosting overwintering ladybugs. Um, and yeah, things that bloom throughout uh, throughout the season. Um, I will mention I do have a bee box sort of. Um, I had an old mailbox I stuffed full of bamboo. That is kind of a controversial practice um, as far as maintenance and ability to spread disease to, um, you know, these nesting uh, pollinators, really the better thing to do is focus on those native plants that provide those hollow pithy stems where, um, you know, really that's what the bee box is mimicking. So, you know, your elderberries, your, um, gosh, you know, your herbaceous plants like dill or parsley or sunflowers that have hollow stems. Um, so you can start thinking about it in that way. Um, and I will show you kind of more of my habitat program or projects. Um, so this is what I'm a little embarrassed about after the whole wildlife interaction, but here we go. Look at these cute little critters. Um, I am in town, um, but we are backed up to those hills that come right down to the river level. Um, and so we do have wildlife. We have deer all over the place. Um, we've had, you know, deer carcasses dragged into the yard, likely by a cat. Um, so yeah, that's something I certainly need to be a little more cognizant of and change some of my practices. I mean, come on, baby skunks. Um, oops. Ah. Um, okay, so I think I'll show you kind of the things I'd like to showcase I think one of the things I'm most proud of and was the most effective in terms of backyard habitat was my pollinator garden. Um, these use a mix of native plants as well as kind of those uh, Mediterranean herbs, woody shrubs. Um, all these plants I propagated myself or came from neighbors or were grown from seed. Um, you know, and it really blooms throughout the season. And I was sure to um, focus on that. You know, we have those early plants like the Oregon sunshine, the penstemons, um, you know, coming on, you know, lupins, um, coming on later is really, you know, your Russian sage, your lavender, yeah, your, um, your more er um, culinary herbs. Um, and then late season, you know, I have the goldenrod, the asters, um, that kind of thing. Um, let's see, here is my plant list. Um, I certainly have tried more plants than this. Um, this is really kind of the, um, my core list that I will plant again. Um, again, you know, if you're in Stevenson, your list is gonna look really different or Snowden or, um, God, we live in such a goofy place with so many transitional zones, but 
um, for Benjamin Washington, this is what I've had success both propagating as well as um, maintaining. Um, and I do really just want to sing the praise of bunch grasses and incorporating those into your landscape. We fo focus so much on flowering plants, but native bunch grasses really do provide a service um, primarily for our beetles. Um, they provide that overwintering habitat. They also, you know, if you're out in the shrub step um, habitat, uh, you'll see these native bunch grasses with um, bare dirt between them, and they kind of keep that space open. Um, and our ground nesting native bees really utilize that space. Um, so yeah, and then also native bunch grasses are absolutely amazing, and our wild grasslands are so incredible in terms of carbon storage and their root systems and their ability to take in atmospheric carbon into their roots and um, really pretty much act as a carbon injection uh, system where they shed their roots twice a year, um, putting that carbon back in the ground. And, you know, some of these plants can have root systems that, um, you know, surpass six feet. So um, there's my plug. And here's your, here's your moment of zen pop of color on our dark winter night. Um, that's, you know, it's just fun. Um, it's really, really fun. Um, so another thing, speaking of bunch grasses and wildflower meadows, um, I uh, wanted to just mention briefly kind of this uh, capitalizing on kind of these multi-gold things. We had this juniper bush where it um, was a fire hazard. It blocked our roadway. It provided a lot of pollen that I was heinously allergic to and really hosted just ground squirrels. Um, it didn't offer a lot in terms of habitat. So we got rid of it. And lo and behold, you know, that juniper that's probably been there for 20 plus years had done all my site prep and weed work for me. So I had just bare ground to plant directly into. And so I grew out grass plugs, lupin plugs, yarrow, and planted straight into it and created um, kind of a bunch grass, flower meadow. Um, and again, I didn't mulch this because I had nice south facing dirt um, that those ground dwelling uh, pollinators, native bees, uh, really like to utilize. And then also, you know, this rock wall behind it, it's fabulous fabulous space for those nest, ground nesting critters as well. So the other thing I think I'm really proud of in this uh, backyard habitat program is the herb garden. Um, you know, we have two and a half acres, but this 10 by 10 um, area is probably my favorite place in the entire yard. Um, you don't need big space to do really incredible things and um, provide this complete entertainment center for watching um, insects utilize your space you know um here again is my plant list of what i have growing in here it's all things that are readily propagated they're all kind of derived from uh, mediterranean climates they're very drought tolerant their flowers produce very nutritious nectar for insects um, and they're all edible you know it's things you cook with um you know you send your small child out to um get something from that section of the garden. Man, anything that ends in their mouth, it's it's okay. Um, yeah, this is a really fun spot um, to be in the yard. Lots of creativity, lots of vertical space, um, lots of potential and changes year after year. Um, so again, I've tapped on this a lot, but I wouldn't have been able to do any of the things I did if I hadn't um, been as financially limited as I am. But that forced me into learning new skills and learning to propagate plants. At its basic level, it's taken a cutting and stuffing it in some dirt and seeing what happens. Um, if it doesn't work, you're not out of anything. Um, it can get more complicated than that, but I don't. I keep it simple. Um, and there's a lot of success. You know, native collection of seed. Um, sharing of plants with your neighbors, conservation district plant sales, or, you know, it justifies purchasing these plants. You know, you can buy one plant and know that you can turn it into 10 more and 10 more the next year off each of those um, and grow your garden exponentially. Um, 
I'm happy to buy a plant. Um, so anyway, uh, there's that. So my lessons learned real quick. I'm sorry, I'm probably going a little over. Um, it's super fun to work with Underwood. Um, it's fun to have Dan out to your place. You know, I do this kind of work as well with technical assistance with landowners for a living, but um, we learn from each other. There's always more to learn, There's always different ways to see things um, and expertise and uh, think people are inspired by different things. Um, again, pick a practice that's exciting to you um, and start small, um, have success and grow from there. Um, or whatever, go big and fail, it's fine, it's all fun. Um, work in your front yard, um, work in a public space. I can't even tell you how many friendships I've um, drummed up from people walking their dog past my yard and I'm out there and they're curious and you get talking. And that's kind of how this thing connects and builds and ripple effects. Um, or the alternate is work where you spend the most time in your yard, where you see it the most, where you're gonna enjoy it the most, where you're gonna maintain it. Um, if you're doing a big installation, do your site prep. Um, I could give an hour presentation on that. So I'll just put that plug in, um, site prep. Be resourceful, be lazy, be cheap. Um, I think those are like the three things to like be successful in my mind. Um, talk to people. There's so many resources out there. Master gardeners are awesome. Conservation districts are awesome. There's so many great books. Your neighbors, nurseries, everyone has something to offer. It's fabulous. Um, and share your lessons learned. Like don't, don't go to the grave with all the things you learned um, and share your plants too. Um, we like to tout native plantings as being lower maintenance, but that doesn't mean without maintenance. Um, there is irrigation and weeding, um, pruning for blooms, um, you know, things that do happen. Um, when you go out in the woods or uh, Catherine Creek or wild areas, uh, look for inspirations. Look how plant communities are gathered. Look at the different levels. Look what's aesthetically pleasing, why that's beautiful. Um, another thing I didn't mention is, um, you know, thinking about grouping plantings, you know, you don't want to do one here, one there, one there, of different things. That's one, it's not aesthetic. There's kind of rules to groupings. Um, you know, I'm sure you've heard the rules of three, five, seven um, groups of plants. Also for forage, um, plants kind of, or insects kind of want groups of plants. They don't just want one of one thing, one of another thing. Um, so thinking of those groupings and how you do that. Um, learn to, again, learn to propagate your own plants. It's nothing more great or gratifying than going shopping in your own nursery. Um, think throughout the seasons, throughout life cycles, and throughout spaces as to what that is offering. The potential is everywhere in every space. Um, if you're even more inspired, participate in the citizen science effort, like the Bumblebee Watch with Xerces Society. That's kind of a great way to just build and contribute to a greater knowledge base in a science-based community. Um, and then really take the time to enjoy the space that we all occupy and think about it um, as we all deserve to be here. Um, so another thing I like about these programs is it gets you thinking bigger and I'm not done yet. So um, we have two and a half acres of oak woodland that are encroached with conifers. So I've started, um, I've gotten a funding source. I've actually done all the work already, but we've released all these oaks for, um, you know, so they don't get shaded out and encroached upon by conifers. There was also a fire adjacent our property this summer, which was horrifying and made me really think I should have done that work a lot earlier. Um, and there's, I guess the point is, is keep thinking big. Um, there's a lot of resources out there, both financially and technical assistance wise that you can capitalize on and totally encourage you to do so. And then finally, um, I wanted to throw this picture in of my yard because it's not all blooms all the time. Um, so you have to be able to handle a little bit of chaos, a little bit of mess um, because you're, you know that those hollow stems that are still there are providing that 
um, nesting ground for those critters, um, you, um, you're seeing the bigger picture of um, that kind of mess. Um, and then also the picture on the right, I just wanted to put that in there, it doesn't have to be big. Get yourself a penstemon, a buckwheat, some Oregon sunshine, sprinkle some California poppies in there and it's beautiful. Um, and that's planted just straight into crap. Um, so anyway, with that, um, thank you all. Thank you for listening to me. It's a little dangerous to let me go unhinged um, on this kind of stuff. It's so fun. And um, I'm happy to um, field any questions or um, you know share those plant lists or um, if you guys have questions later on, uh, you know where to find me now. Awesome, Chris. Thanks for all your efforts and energy here. It's fun to fun to see all that work pay off with those beautiful blooms. Awesome. Yeah, good job, Chris. Thank yeah. You. I and just the for the sake of time, I think we're gonna move um, into just the last slides that I have for the day for the evening. But then if there's any discussion in Q&A, we can, we can end on that and that way people that need to go can go. Um, but I'm just gonna throw on my last couple slides. And then if you guys wanna do your, um, any other sketching on your little property maps, that's great. Um, if anyone wants to share that in a few minutes, that's also great. But first I wanna, um, give special thanks to Chris and the Hood River Soil and Water Conservation District. As I mentioned, some of those earlier slides um, were also from Hood River. And um, so thank you. And thanks to Todd for being here tonight with WDFW. Um, we've also borrowed some ideas from Oklahoma County Conservation District with their yard by yard program. Um, so Dan originally uh, got some of these yard by yard uh, checklist concepts out of um, Oklahoma from Kevin Mink. And the National Association of Conservation Districts also provided some really important startup funding for this program for us. So we're thankful, very grateful for that support. Um, and then finally, um, Audubon Society and Columbia Land Trust have a, a backyard habitat program in the Portland area, uh, which has also been an inspiration for us as we've developed this program. So definitely want to give credit there where due. Um, so yeah, finally, just let's end with um, any discussion, any challenges, questions that you have for your properties, um, things that you've been thinking about and, and wonder about in terms of what your next steps are, or does anyone want to share a beautiful sketch from, <laughs> or not beautiful, it does not have to be, um, in any way finished. Um, these are all living projects, um, so to speak. Any questions out there? Any discussion? Y'all have been such a tame audience. <laughs> I'm curious what practices people are interested in focusing on. If drought is kind of at the forefront of your heads or fire mitigation, pollinator habitat, um, specific critters. Yeah, what are the concerns out there or the, the strong interests? <clears throat> Barbara Bailey, I think I see a hand up. Uh, yeah, I um, am interested in trying uh, hubble culture for water conservation and growing food. Um, and uh, also really, I was real interested, Chris, in, uh, in the pithy plant uh, issue. Um, I was thinking of growing a uh, sort of a, a seasonal sunflower hedge, but I guess what I'm understanding is that uh, as they as they get old and ugly, that they're still important, and so I have to leave those the whole year for these for these guys, huh? 
you know, that's always the question. I feel like I hit a point somewhere where I just need to <laughs> clean some things up. But, you know, if there's a place that's out of sight um, that you can let them go or, you know, even if you pull them down and lay them horizontal, um, you can oh, see, um, that will work. Retain some of that benefit. Oh, good. That's good to know. Thanks. We had just a couple of comments in the chat here. Um, one was on just the recording of this event. And yes, we did record it and it'll be posted on the UCD website um, in the coming week. And then a couple of things that are on folks' mind. Um, one says, I've participated in UCD's Firewise program and what plants can I replace my lawn with that are fire resistant? Dan, you want to tackle that one? Well, sure. I mean, that, that would be helpful to sort of learn a little bit more, for instance, east side or west side of the mountains. Um, and I would also say, secondly, it depends on the goals, right? Um, what is the, the, the hope? What, do you, what, what is the end result that we want to go for? So um, decide those, you know, um, think, about, think about those. Is this a, a really droughty, dry side or, or is it a little more wet and lush? That'll um, decide a little bit what the plant pellets are and then decide what the goals are. And those will drive, um, yeah. You know, so drive some follow-up questions or comments there. So west side and trying to maintain like a fifty-foot barrier of that green space. So kind of that maybe conundrum between um, having that uh, low green space but not a lawn. Yeah, on the west side. Um, there are a lot of thicket forming plants from low uh, stuff that tends to grow low, like salal, um, which presumably will be not very fire prone um, and could be trimmed. You know, it wouldn't, wouldn't kill it to, to sort of trim it as necessary. Taller stuff, um, sort of medium sized stuff would be, you know, things like snowberry or thimbleberry. So, so thicket forming, those grow higher than a lawn, but could be readily trimmed or, or you know, whacked into shape, or you could cut um, trails through it and that sort of thing. Okay, great, thank you. I'm gonna, um, put, a, I'm gonna put a publication in the chat that also lists out a bunch of fire resistant plant ideas. So I'll put that right there, just one second. Okay. Um, another uh, question here of something to deal with is rat management without uh, poison. Also, um, floodlights being close to downtown. So I don't know what the, yeah, rodents. Um. Yeah, I could talk about that a little bit. I'll, I'll have to do a little bit more research on the rat question, that's not something I encounter a whole lot. Um, obviously, that's something where it takes, it's probably not just a single yard issue. That's probably something that takes a whole neighborhood or a, a city approach. Um, you know, if, if everyone got rid of bird feeders, that would probably reduce the amount of available forage for rats substantially. So that's, I mean, that's a, a good first step, but that's something you need to get a lot of folks on board with uh, to implement that. Yeah, I can do some more research on on rat management. I'll get back to you there. Great, thank you. Um, also, have a question: Does anyone have ideas for how to control quack grass? There's, um, a couple of folks have mentioned that as being a <laughs> problem for them. Looks like we have a, another comment here after. Um, after they use the Pulaski on it. So maybe that's one of the <laughs> ways mm. to get rid of it. 
Well, I would, this is Dan, I would say, um, without being sort of a, a lawn and grass expert, um, sort of the same things I said before, you know, think about where you are, your climate, think about what your goals are, and um, kind of see what's at the matrix of those two, uh, those two questions. If it's just to get rid of quack grass for the sake of quack grass, um, or if there's something you're specifically going for. And I know Quackgrass has an awful lot written about it online. I don't have a, a sort of go-to um, document, but I'm sure there's an extension service, you know, um, handout that talks about that. And I would say Google would be your friend in that in that case. So decide what what you want and what plants would fill that, uh, you know, would meet that goal before trying to tackle it. Real quick before people start to disappear, I um, realized we do have one more poll and I just want to make sure you know it's there. We're going to launch it here shortly um, to just give a little bit of quick immediate feedback on this workshop. So if you don't mind, um, Jan, I think I need you to, thanks. But we can keep talking. Um, any other questions out there? Comments? Well, there's a comment here that there's an, an excellent webinar called Old Rats on rat management from the OSU um, Extension Service. So if that's something you're dealing with too, check that out. Excellent. I think we're just over the eight o'clock hour, so maybe we'll start to wrap up. Um, any other uh, quick questions we can handle? Otherwise, we're going to start to say our goodbyes for now. Until next time. <laughs> We really appreciate y'all coming tonight and participating. I hope you came up with some ideas and maybe even a drawing or two to, to go forward with. Um, and you know how to reach us. And then if you're not in our district or if you're in Hood River, um, there's a local conservation district for you wherever you are. So um, get a hold of us and um, we'll look forward to seeing you again. Sign up for the next few workshops if you, if you can. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Have a safe and Bye -bye. happy holiday.